In this upcoming conversation, uh, we will be focusing on provisions for special educational needs in an international school context. Uh, we'll be discussing current provisions for SEN students based on the speaker's experiences of the regions they've worked in. We'll also consider strategies that each guest has put in place that has worked and why, and consider what more can be done to further enhance and develop provisions for students with special educational learning needs around the world. I'm delighted to be joined by my guests. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Um, and I think we'll just go straight into the first question, um, which is, what do current SEM provisions look like across mainstream schools, both states and private? Um, who'd like to, to kick off that first? I can, uh, I can start off from a UAE perspective, um, if that's okay. So I've been in the UAE for um, around nine years now. Um, started off in Dubai, then went to Abu Dhabi, now back in Dubai again. Um, and a lot has changed in the past nine years. Um, even when I used to come and visit um, family and friends previously since 2009 in the UAE, a lot has been done for um, special needs. Um, we have the term people of determination now, um, whereas previously um, it was more centered around special education needs. Now, looking at your question of the current SEND provision, um, in the UAE, we have national schools, which is mostly um, Islamic-based schools, Arabic-based schools, and then we have international schools. Some of these international schools are um, private funded and some are government funded. So based on my experience, um, and I don't know if Sophie can agree because I know she's my backup in the UAE as well with regards to information, um, it depends on uh, finances firstly, uh, what the school status is as well. Um, and the level of provision that they want to focus on. So there are still a lot of schools that do not want to focus on SEN um, and they kind of redirect their funds or their resources towards other areas. And STEAM is a really big um, thing now in the UAE with especially the new, um, there's a new enterprise um, entrepreneurship and science uh, initiative that they launched recently as well. So there's a lot of effort being put into other areas. Um, so I do think it depends on which school you're in, which district you're in. Um, and again, funding is, is very important. And also I would say management, leadership, if leadership is passionate about um, SEN and how they want to implement it and how supportive they are of us as SENCOs, then definitely there they will be provision. Um, and if they're open to to listening to us, then yeah, that that's what I think. Yeah, definitely, Angelic. I can confirm that. But your past experience in the UAE, <laughs> uh, definitely. I haven't been here for so long, but what I can say is that there's a definite push from local schools to get better academic results to compare those results with international schools as well. Yeah. Um, one of the advantages, if you if you may, about being in international and private schools is that you have other organizations um, that check on what you're doing, such as BSO or CIS that come to schools. And one of the biggest drives for them is inclusion, how much we are providing to students and how good is the quality of that provision. Um, so it's one of the definite advantages of being in international schools, but also private. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We just uh, finished our um, inspection recently. And we also have other inspection bodies like NIASC, which is our international board um, that also checks up on us. And, and I absolutely love now that every aspect of um, questions in general teaching as well has elements of um, inclusion practice or adaptive curriculum within it embedded in the in the inspection which is great because before it would kind of be very separate but now I would say overall it's around 40 percent of a school's um, grading uh, relies on the inclusion of the school and how inclusive the school is in the environment. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also really happy to say that uh, this year, as we've also gone through inspections and we will continue going through inspections this year, there's also a focus on gifted and talented too under the umbrella of inclusion, which was a very happy surprise for me because that's not always treated in the same way or um, given the necessary importance because a lot of governing bodies and schools, if I may, uh, believe that well, they have what they need. Why, why do we focus on them? However, this time I was so happy when they started inquiring about the provision that we have. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a very nice surprise. 
Mm-hmm. David Carmita, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. From the UK perspective, um, I, I think that we are lucky to have um, in a snapshot of a history aspect of long-standing statutory um, provisions for uh, SEN needs. So starting from way back in 1944, uh, where they had the first Education Act, uh, right down to the Families Act in 2014 and SEN Code of Practice, we are bound by a lot of uh, statutory laws uh, on provision. Uh, initially, way back a hundred years ago, it was all about SEN kids who had medical needs. Now it's all about their actual cognitive needs. So we've made a long, long stretch of uh, um, uh, trial and errors to come to the point where I think inclusion is now on its good legs and we are providing for what is what we call uh, additional and different to provision for most of our kids. Uh, at the state sector or in the state sector, the, the, the main focus is on non fee paying schools. So they get a lot of resources, training, and all these aspects. Whereas in the private sector, um, they're fee paying. So it all depends on how much the school can generate to provide. And this can be an advantage as well as a disadvantage. Um, as for inspections, which uh, Angelique also mentioned, uh, we have since the last, I think, 20 years in the IB sector, had rigorous inspections to the IB and uh, ISN, as they call it, ISA uh, inspections. And these have now noticed how much provision is required to identify, to assess all the children in special needs. And this is a massive progress. And I felt that in our last inspection, the inspectors were more aware of what a SENCO needs to provide to cater for all the needs of the kids. So it's basically down to in private schools, how much provision can be brought through the finances they have. Whereas in the state sector, it is more about adhering to the laws and the statutory rights that each child gets. And then again, we have all this gourmet of um, EHCP plans, which is education healthcare plans that uh, are provided by the state government. And even in a private school, if we have an EHCP child, also known as a statemented child, we have to go according to the provisions outlined by the local government for that child. Whether we have it or not, that is the challenge that I face most mm -hmm. of the time because we are driven by how much provision and funding we can provide to cater for the needs of the children. But I think uh, in a nutshell, the, we've gone a long way and we are looking at every need. We are looking at the strengths of the children rather than their weaknesses to ensure that their provision is catered for. Hmm. Yeah, I think adding to what Amita said that I think in education, in uh, specifically in special needs, I think the countries across the world have come a very long way in changing their ideas, their ideology, and accepting diverse learners all across the world, I would say. So my journey has started from India, where I've worked for eight years uh, in state level schools and also international schools. So I've moved from a segregated environment to an integrated environment to an inclusive school, where, and now to an inclusive school in China, where they have inclusion, not only in their mission, but also in their actions, I would say. So uh, there is a very, uh, there is for our, the ideology here in the school currently is that every teacher is a special needs teacher. Every teacher needs to address diverse learners. And uh, with, an, uh, with an IB school, with uh, the funding being so strong as everybody's mentioned that finances is a very key important aspect in schools. I think when finances are good enough, the teachers get that quality uh, a professional development where they're able to cater to the diverse learning needs and are able to scaffold instructions that are provided in the classrooms. So I think the uh, ideas and the missions are changing for a lot of people, depending upon also by external factors like uh, CIS, NIASC, who are regularly coming uh, to visit schools, to assess schools with the prime idea of inclusion. Uh, I would say that the world is changing and inclusion 
and special needs and acceptance of diverse learners is out there. So that's gr a great news for all of us. Brilliant. And yeah, I think that sort of goes really nicely onto um, looking at specific regions and how SEM provisions differ um, or potentially differ depending on the region that you're working in. I know you will have such varied um, international experience. It'd be great to, to now look at you know, how SEN support um, differs depending on the regions around the world. Um, who'd, like to, who'd like to kick off with that one? Um, well, I can say that in the US, as, in, as it is in Ecuador, um, the provision for special educational needs and disabilities, it is embedded in the legislation. It's there and it's been there for good 20 years already. However, it usually takes a little time for schools to catch up and to actually offer good quality provision. Um, in the US, even though it is embedded in the policies of schools as well, it doesn't necessarily happen all the time in local schools because they also depend on the funding and how much funding they can have. My experience in Ecuador is the opposite experience. Um, I was working in a British international school um, and the focus and the driving force of the school was diversity and inclusion. And yes, it was a private international school. However, um, they were paying a lot of attention to that. They were driven by inclusion and how much diversity enriches the learning of other students, not just the students with uh, special educational needs and disabilities. And now I am fresh here in the UAE and um, I live in Sharjah, it's one of the Emirates here. And we're also regulated by private education authorities uh, uh -huh. who are now catching up <laughs> to what the world needs, a holistic approach when it comes to education. And they're now really big in well-being, they're creating committees in well-being and under the umbrella of well-being, they are looking at inclusion and quality provision for all students. Brilliant. Devika, how about yourself in uh, China currently? I see that, you know, uh, provisions here, working in an IV school, uh, I wouldn't have like much idea currently about state schools in China because they are heavily guided and uh, followed through by the Chinese government, where a lot of emphasis is put on understanding the Chinese culture and history. So working with an IB school, I feel that there are very strict policies and uh, the leadership team has greatly implemented great policies on inclusion and diversity in our school, which is there uh, right in front of us. Also, uh, there is great focus on accepting and embracing diversity. Uh, we, it's it's uh, for us, I feel that, you know, it's focusing uh, not only on special needs, but also on uh, students with different language needs, students with uh, who are gifted and talented and having different policies around it. So uh, to add to this, like, you know, a simple policy, like it is very difficult to get certain parents of the culture, of the culture here to get on board with special needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a difficult conversation that we need to have uh, specifically in a country like China to make parents understand and accept about uh, how their child learns differently. Uh, so for us, uh, even, uh, even though when the parents are taking time to come on board, we try to provide an accommodated learning plan for the child, which is uh, followed through and uh, learned by the teachers to support the child uh, in an inclusive setup. I know there is like an IP that we have that we follow for the child. We have like a psychological report for the child. Uh, we are working in coordination and collaboration with the teachers. But we also uh, try to provide uh, accommodated learning plans uh, till the time the parents come on board so that we are able to support that learner's needs. Uh, so yeah, I would say in China, it is kind of a little difficult to uh, make parents understand and also accept that the child might have different needs and how we need to together work towards those uh, situations together. Really yeah. interesting. Amita, Angelique, any, any thoughts on that before we move on to the next question? Structure absolutely differs. And I'd like to put this in the perspective of the developed world and the developing world. Uh, with the developed Western world population, uh, there is more awareness, so there is more provision. And this was more so evident during the COVID time when we found that communication, lack of communication, hampered the learning of most of our SEN children 
uh, lack of resources. And I think one take from COVID, which uh, uh, has uh, really been highlighted, is uh, now the developed world with its vast knowledge of communication can actually help the developing countries with this yeah. knowledge to catch up. And forums like what you have today itself is an indicator of uh, how we can provide a better service by increasing our knowledge. So that's just a snapshot um, on the regional aspect of uh, difference in structure. Mm. I, um, I was thinking from my side, looking at um, South African context of um, back when I was at uni, um, we all had the option of going into, um, sorry, going into um, uh, poorer communities um, and supporting the kids there. Uh, what, what is very sad though is money is such a big thing now as well. And even in the Western world, um, research that I previously conducted um, in the UAE specifically, parents spend over 5,000 um, dirhams if their child, depending on what their needs are, between 2,000 and 5,000 dirhams a week. Um, and that's separate to school fees and things. And, and looking back at when I had to um, teach in literally container schools, I don't know if everyone is familiar with container schools, but it's literally um, a truck um, that they put in a very, very poor community. And that is that they revamped the inside of the truck into or um, literally like a transport container or import export container. They revamped it into a, in, into a classroom for, um, for these kids. Um, in very poor communities and if we mm. saw kids with special needs it wasn't um, it was more along the lines of immediate mm. needs the child doesn't have shoes the child doesn't have clothes would the child have enough meals to eat that day rather than looking at the fact that they have intellectual impairment or down syndrome or any other conditions that they might have so um, and, and really we just focused on on loving the kids there um, and now being here in the UAE, and I can agree with um, what Devika said earlier um, about parents being very hesitant. I mean, here in the UAE, in Dubai specifically, I had a lot more, I would say, hesitant parents in Abu Dhabi because Abu Dhabi is a little bit more conservative. Um, and I think Sophie can agree as well. Sandra is a little bit more conservative as well. <laughs> um, but in Dubai, I, I always have 50-50. I have parents that are very Western educated, um, parents that are very knowledgeable, but are very hesitant to say that their kids have special needs or or even if they kids have special needs, they still have this in the back of their mind. Um, there's going to be a cure. Um, we need to make sure that we do A, B and C so that, you know, they're going to be right, all right in a couple of years time. Um, and I and I recently had this conversation with a, with a parent actually saying, um, you know, I, I want my child to be able to to read at a grade 11 level, for example, um, they need to read by at the end of the year, they need to be at a grade 11 level. Um, and this child intellectual ability is currently at a grade three level um, and kind of bringing the parent down to let's focus rather on jumping the gun to grade 11 let's focus on smaller milestones um, for that child and it doesn't mean the child isn't achieving but there's so much stigma as well amongst families and um, traditional communities and just religious perspectives and cultural perspectives of you know if your child isn't perfect or if your child doesn't fit said mold of um, and again I mean I think Asian culture and UAE culture, Middle Eastern culture is very similar in that my child needs to get 96%. The teacher gets an email. Why didn't my child get 99%? Why didn't my child get 100%? Um, and they keep on forgetting that there's your your child is amazing the way they are. And I, I might be the, the hippie of the group now saying that, <laughs> but I really do believe that like every child is special in the way they are. And um, there's this beautiful quote that I shared with a parent the other day about um, don't compare your um, don't compare the sun and the moon they shine when it's their time and I and I always try to remind parents of that quote to say your child will shine when it's their time don't don't push them to read at a grade 11 level when they're not ready for it yet so yeah I, I digress <laughs> but it, it oh, I need to remember that myself <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
parents. Can, can I also... the, the one of the one of the key stakeholders is, is obviously parents, isn't it? In in this um, piece too. So it's um, I mean we'll move on to a bit around the sort of the strategies and best practices around that um, over the next couple of couple of questions. But yeah, it's a it's a key key piece into that needs to be considered. So um, yeah, I mean before we move on to the next question, does anyone have any any last yes. things to say on that? Yes, and that's all I glorified the Western world. Let me just uh, quickly yes. add in that the cultural aspect is very important. As you know, dyslexia was considered to be a reading problem and mm -hmm. the kids were considered to be uh, not normal many, many years ago. But this has not changed as much in the way the culture of some parents perceive uh, learning difficulties, even mm -hmm. in the Western world. And we find parents uh, are actually a barrier when you actually uh, have to explain to them that the child has a difficulty, whether it be ASD, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, or uh, specific learning difficulties like dyslexia, dyscalculia. Even in private schools, we have parents who are hesitant to receive that information and to act on it according to the guidance of the SENCO. So there is still a cultural um, stigma involved in uh, identifying the needs of the child, uh, even in UK. We just mm -hmm. recently had a situation where I've had to produce several evidences from teachers, uh, assessment evidences, to be able to say that your child really needs the support and this is how I've identified the child mm -hmm. as having special education needs. Um, we have the support from the government, but uh, there is still a problem, uh, even in the developed world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to add to what Amita said, uh, uh, whenever uh, I've seen this very often in my personal experience that uh, whenever we are uh, touching bases with the parent, when we are uh, planning to inform them or discuss anything uh, like this with the parents, we do have to be prepared, we do have to collect a lot of evidences from the teachers to be able to tell them uh, and discuss with them that the child has uh, certain needs and there is additional need requirement that should come to from the school and from towards the parents towards the child. I think that is um, we I still feel that in my experience, I need to go very prepared for a meeting uh, to have a heavy conversation with the parent and also be able to listen to them, even if they are complaining, but also be able to highlight uh, the shining points for the child but also where we need to uh, provide that kind of support for the child to shine even more mm. so yes Brilliant. and that, that sort of leads really nice on to um on to the next question which is looking at sort of current best practices um what do you, if we can just each touch on a few of these current best practices that each of you have picked up in your own school context um talking about effective inclusive SEN policies um Who'd like to, to pick up on that with a few couple of best practice um, things that they picked up? Um, Sophia, yeah. Uh, yeah, Max, what well, you just said, policies. We have to have a strong, concise, robust, clear policies that state what everyone needs to do, what everyone roles is about. Uh, because if we don't know where we're going, how are we going to expect our teachers, our senkos, mm. our parents to know where they're going? So I think having strong, solid policies is, is a must <laughs> and it's, it's part of best practice. I would also say that in my experience, working with parents from the admission process, getting to know the child during admissions and making sure you build that trust with the families, it's going to make those difficult conversations a little bit easier and it's going to make them a little bit more accepting of a potential need that may arise in the future yeah i i agree with what you said sophie um that's true policies are very important i also wanted to add earlier we spoke about um having teachers be i think you mentioned it devika where you said um teachers are also part of our inclusion um, you know, they put inclusion into practice. They are SEN teachers essentially as well with this new inclusion model where, you know, again, no child gets left behind, but we want all kids to be included in mainstream school settings, um, regardless of their difficulties. So from my perspective, what I found works best is professional learning communities where we um, where we educate teachers 
because not all teachers are SEN motivated or SEN familiar or have a frame of reference of SEN. Um, they might be excellent language teachers, excellent social studies history teachers, excellent KG teachers or FS teachers, but um, they, they lack in certain practices or um, they have really good understanding of pedagogy and methodology, but they kind of it's sort of like they forget along the way how to apply it to SEN kids because I feel like a lot of teachers have it in them they just forget it and then you kind of remind them and they go oh yeah <laughs> that kind of works um, and I had this question recently where um, a senior leader asked me what do I do different in my class because in my class I have um, I just cater to special needs kids um, and I um they, they're partially include. It's a partial inclusion model of the ASDAN program. So um, mm. I, I teach them about, let's say, 60% of the time and 40% 40, 40 of the rest of the time they're in mainstream classes in the rest of the school. So what do I do differently in my class? And I really had to think about it because comparing my journey before when I was a grade one teacher, when I was a KG, when I was grade five teacher, when I taught grade 10, um, and just in general as a Senko and a Sen teacher, what do I do different? And um, I, I really don't think that I do anything majorly different. I really just, I mean, the way I speak to the kids, I think is, is the major thing that's different. Uh, if I speak to my mainstream um, kids that are on grade five and grade one, I differentiate my instructions. Um, I make sure that I use real life instructions. I use Makaton here and there. And I feel Makaton is something that all kids can benefit from, not just kids with special needs. Um, but again, Sorry, there's Andrew, not. Can you just go into yeah. Makaton a little bit and just elaborate on, yes. on what that is? Sure. Um, Makaton is um, sort of like sign language, if I can put it that way. So it's just general um, signs that can help kids that are either nonverbal or kids, uh, especially in our settings where we have a lot of Arabic speaking students. So we have one card that we use either for PECS, which is the visual communication model, um, or um, Widget Online, which is another one that's great. So showing them a card of bathroom, um, them knowing that it's toilet or hammam, uh, depending depending on their language and their ability rather than just, you know, kind of shouting at them, do you want to go to the bathroom and then not understanding using that sort of a bridging model of communication um, so that they understand a little bit more. Um, but in general, I think that if we change our practices, um, again, again, I'm going to say something that's probably so silly, but I really do feel like I I firstly, I love my kids so much. And I feel if I build a relationship with them and they know that, that I care about them, then they respond well. And it, it doesn't just apply to special needs kids. It applies to all kids. If I show them I love them and I care about them and I remember their birthday, for example. Um, I know when I was teaching in grade five, um, some of the, because I was in a segregated school, some of the girls were really shocked that I remembered their birthday. Um, and that I actually got them something on their birthday. And it's the same with um, recently had a special needs kid in my class having her birthday. Best unicorn rainbow birthday ever. I mean, <laughs> it's it's just small things that you do that, that makes them want to come to school. Because there are so many kids, again, kids with dyslexia, kids with ADHD that don't want to come to school because they find it so hard. Um, teachers don't understand them. They have so many things going on in their life and they find it hard to process so just a little bit of tlc i would say that's that's the major difference mm -hmm. i don't know if anyone else has any <laughs> I, I will just add to what you're saying you know uh, uh like a teacher training program is what you mentioned is uh extremely vital and yeah. i totally agree with it you know i just want to share an example that uh in the current school where i'm working uh, about 40 or 50 teachers were given a choice to join a differentiation course with Harvard. And we are a group of large 40 to 50 teachers who are currently doing it together at the same time and coordinating meetings during school hours and after school hours to understand uh, great differentiation strategies that can be used in classrooms. And um, during this process, I understood how many teachers, you know, as a special educator, I often go to classes inside to support the students. And during those times, I've realized how many of the teachers are really inculcating what they've learned in their program in the training week and during they have implemented all of that in their classroom with the students to see how it helps and how it's supporting the diverse learners in the classroom 
So I totally agree with your point that, you know, a policy of a continuous professional development, yeah. uh, not only uh, by giving teachers a choice simply or providing bite-sized uh, PDs during lunch times or yeah. any time that is convenient for the school community is a must. And also uh, to add to it, I think uh, for me, mm -hmm. uh, what I see working wonders is collaboration with the mainstream teachers and meeting yeah. up with the subject teachers to, uh, and you know, it's inclusion is not only for the students, it's also for the special educators to be a part of the entire community, uh, to plan curriculum, to plan activities, or if you want, you want to lead a simple activity in class or maybe uh, discuss with the, uh, the grade level coordinators or the teachers how we can differentiate and scaffold activities for um, our English lab students, for our uh, students who have uh, different needs and uh, how can we provide the assessment to the students. So in a way, we are working very closely with two different departments where we are, like you said, that not everybody, everybody wants to help the students, but they might not know how to help the students. Yeah, exactly. And I think is where we come in the picture to help them and tell them how we can help the students by helping them understand differentiation and scaffolding and accommodations for our students so yeah. and making that it okay making it okay because there's so many and i always yeah. find i hope that um you know no one is offended if they're per, a, a permanent pro, secondary teacher but i feel as a senko i always have difficulties with secondary teachers um, yeah. primary teachers and my KG teachers are always good with adapting and changing and everything. But when I get to secondary, the secondary teachers are very hesitant. They um, don't always know. And just making it okay to say, I don't know, come to me, let me, let's talk about it. Not even me, because I had an excellent um, discussion where I had a uh, 10, 12 teachers, um, some of the teachers very hesitant to, to implement things that we want them to implement. Others saying like, why don't you do it? And that discussion led to many other ideas and generating new um, policies and procedures that they felt comfortable with. So it wasn't just me telling them, this is what I need you to do because ADEC wants me to do it or K KHTA wants me to do it or MOE wants me to do it. But it's what what's good for you as a teacher, but also good for the kids at the end of the day. I think what you're saying about educators, well, for educators, um, the unknown can be very scary. I still have uh, some colleagues, different ages, seasoned teachers have been here and there around the world teaching, and to them, it's still their worst nightmare when a child asks them a question and they don't know the answer. <laughs> Imagine uh, presenting them with a whole new world of information and expecting them to translate that into their lessons. So I think it can be scary, but it also shows how valuable learning communities are. I had a wonderful head of the student support department in my previous school who said, by creating learning communities, you can give teachers a chance to show off what their best practice is. And you have to give educators that opportunity. And also we are subtly telling them, and this is how you learn. <laughs> Peer learning is mm -hmm. important. Uh, teamwork is important. And as an A-level psychologist, secondary teacher, Angelique, <laughs> um, I just wanna- I, just wanna I didn't make you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think it's so amazing to have these conversations because I use British Sign Language with my A-level psychology students. Oh, yeah. These are students 12 and 13. And I identified that by giving them um, certain uh, signs from British Sign Language, they have that extra two seconds to really think about their answers. So with my year 12s who are still getting used to my teaching, right? My very <laughs> progressive teaching. Uh, we're only doing true, false, and I need time to think about it. Uh, and it's, it, it has been amazing. They don't even have to explain themselves. They just tell me how they're feeling in that moment. And that, you, that way we're using cold calls, which is something everyone likes to see. But we're also integrating British Sign Language. We are catering to different needs and we're giving them a chance to um, express themselves in a very safe uh, environment. That's amazing, and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll touch on some of the strategies that you guys have uh, just spoken about there in in, in our next question. Um, but yeah, that's that's awesome stuff. Any 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 other final thoughts on that best practices with regards to SEM policies before we move on to um, some key tips and strategies? I think from the UK perspective, again, uh, differentiation has been the key for many many years, and I still find it difficult that at secondary level differentiation is still a hit and miss. And many conversations with teachers uh, regarding the needs of the child, the learning abilities, 
seem to be taken on board, but when it comes to classroom practice, it's always something that you hope is done. And everything that you've taught the child in withdrawal situations is transferred and supported by the teacher in the classroom. Uh, and everything else that Angelique, Devika and Sophie have said, the main, I think, core of best practice is the collaboration, the consistency in which everything is brought together with the whole learning situation and the provision, as, as well as the common professional development, because without that, we still have problems of, I didn't know that child had um, ASD. I didn't know that child had dyslexia. So the provision of dif differentiation is still something I think we need a lot more support from many, many forums and many educators. Um, and uh, trying to collaborate with uh, different kinds of partnerships, even outside the school. If we can collaborate more with the speech and language therapist, the OT, occupational therapists, psychologists, counselors, there seems to be a lot more, you have a lot more ways of introducing it in terms of needs mm. to be met by the teachers. So that's form of differentiation as well. But the whole world of differentiation and the best pra practice aspect of uh, getting teachers to understand how to produce differentiate material and become teachers of SEN students, all teachers are teachers of SEN, as Devika mentioned, is the core of the problems that we face in the next coming years because um, there is a lot more emotional needs now. We have mm -hmm. so many kids uh, and we ourselves are beginning to understand the level of need in terms of social emotional, which impinges on their learning. And that mm -hmm. itself has become such a tremendous need, just not just the academic, that uh, I think differentiation will have to have another twist of social emotional aspects of learning, which we need to provide the teachers with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and now sort of looking at some of these sort of key tips and strategies, um, sort of actionable, practical things that you guys have implemented in your own classrooms. Um, it'd be great to now have a look at have a look at those. So um, if we sort of start off with, you know, what, what are some of the key tips or strategies that, that each of you have implemented um, that have worked um, and maybe a little bit around the outcome? Uh, and then we can maybe touch on some of the things that maybe you tried that um, maybe didn't work as, as well as you wanted and, and maybe why that was. So um yeah, who'd like to kick off some some key tips or strategies that, that you guys implemented in your own classroom? Um, Devika, do you want to do you want to jump in with that one? Yeah, maybe. I think one strategy uh, that is not a policy, but like a strategy that I worked on with the few of my students, definitely depending on the needs of the students, is working on an IP alongside my student. Uh, so what uh, I tried to do is that I used to set goals uh, for my student with my student. And uh, that was uh, that came out really well because that is a kind of reflection for the student. That is also metacognition for the student where he or she is able to understand uh, where, where he needs to work on and what and aligning goals for himself or herself in the IEP. So uh, this really worked very well for me uh, back in India where I used to work. And also uh, now in China, what we do is we also involve students in attending their own IP meetings with their parents. Uh, it's a very, it's a very, it's a Western culture. Uh, it's a culture from USA perhaps uh, to have students attend their own educational meetings uh, since it's like a legal requirement also. Uh, but it's, uh, it, you know, the positives of working in a diverse culture that you learn from each other. You learn from uh, how teachers are implementing things and you know what is working for what. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful. It's, so recently for an IP meeting, it was wonderful to have a student leading his own meeting with his parents, explaining what works for him, what doesn't work for him, and how what kind of support he would be needing so it was a very it was a it was a wonderful uh, it was actually a wonderful meeting with the parents where uh, uh, we openly exchanged our views we gave feedbacks we addressed issues and the future goals that we can have so i think this is one strategy that i um, 
really liked and i would love to see it happening more with many people in different parts of the world where students can for real take uh, onus of their own learning and understand understand where they are actually leading to so yeah perfect that sounds amazing and i think it's it's something i wanted to share too i think having a student input when working with special educational needs and disabilities is essential if we really want to have a holistic understanding of the student but we don't hear what they think or we don't know how they feel then we're not really catering to their needs <laughs> um i have a really good example in my previous school we came up with amazing worksheets they were uh designed by the student they had all the animals that the student liked the student learned how to use them in class, which was our goal to have this student be part of the lesson, of course. Um, and then we, we told the student, OK, how are you feeling? How, how are you doing with the worksheets? The student didn't want to see the worksheets anymore. And I was so sad to think that, you know, it took so long for the student to get there. And, and then I asked the, a crazy question, why not? <laughs> um, and the student said that, well, this was during science. And during science, they were doing group work. And everyone was doing experiments and having fun. And this student was in the corner doing the worksheets. Of course, this student didn't want to have anything to do with the worksheets. So then we realized that there was a, a gap in between the communication from the SENCOs and the learning support team and how the worksheets were supposed to be used. We used them in a very nice way during our one-to-one -one interactions. but. Did that translate to group work? Not really. So we needed to reevaluate our practice. And I think that's one of the, the best things that we need to do um, as educators, as counselors, as SENCOs, to have the ability and the resilience to reevaluate our practices. That's why we need to have good teams. I'm very lucky that throughout my career in education, I've always had amazing teammates who have said to me, that was great, but who have also said to me, that wasn't so great. <laughs> Can you think of something else? <laughs> and I think that's, that's one of them abilities that we need to develop when, when working in the schools. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention is um, to build support networks inside the school has worked wonders for me. So I have been able to identify some teachers that are great at scaffolding written work, for example, and there are some others that are not. And I would just pair them up and ask them to have a conversation about how to do that. That way I'm giving them the resource. I'm not doing the work myself because it will be impossible to work with every single teacher at all times. And they're learning from each other. And I can go for days about peer learning, how important peer learning is. That's amazing, Sophia. Just jumping in there, how, how did you create those um... Uh, those those connections within the school um, and how did you um, yeah what kind of tools did you use so they could carry those conversations on within school mm -hmm. so I am very talkative <laughs> so just by asking them um, in the English department I have two friends here and there who are great colleagues what do you do during these specific tasks so I know the questions that I'm asking they're very targeted questions I know what kind of information I want to have and then of course uh, asking them if they will be willing to share their practice this is a first step because the next step would be to have the learning communities that we shared that we talked about before and actually having them um, lead a CPD session for the rest of the staff who are interested in that topic. So I think the first step is a very um, small, <laughs> it's a very small, um, yeah, a group of people, a pool of people that I have identified that have a specific strengths and that are, are also willing to sit down with a colleague and answer some of their questions. It hasn't been very difficult to find teachers and colleagues with strengths. They're educators, of course, of course, they're marvelous at what they do. It has been a little bit more difficult um, to find other colleagues who are willing to sit down and ask the questions that they might have, that has been a bit more challenging. But I am having these, um, these sessions, if you may, as very um, casual conversations. I'm arranging them, you know, coffee and biscuits here and there so you can talk about what you're doing great in your classroom and see if that way we can um, start the process of creating larger uh, learning communities. That's amazing. Something I'd like to add what Sophie said, the, we've been starting what is called a um, development uh, period uh, after school and our um, teachers come together and some of the sessions are on SEN. And taking a more pastoral view, most of our kids lack self-confidence, as we know, um, special needs kids lack self-confidence. And it's how the teachers instill the self-confidence through positive language, uh, understanding the child's needs. And what I've done is instead of getting the teachers to look through several reports, which is always a barrier for um, teachers, is to provide at a glance 
um, fine tracker which records the child's needs, also their grades. So each department can see in each subject area how the child has transited from say year seven to year eight at a glance. This has helped provide the teachers more incentives to look at the needs of the children. So in these sessions, we tease out what are their needs and how each of us can share good practice. So very much like what um, you've just mentioned, the common professional development is the best practice possible in most schools because you can share the needs and um, the, uh, the, the provisions that you put in place and how they can help with that as well. Uh, and as for differentiation, I've had a, a very successful um, um, uh, program with uh, some of the parents themselves. An ADHD parent kept complaining that the child's needs were not met. So I thought, how am I going to get this through to the teachers? Uh, as well as the child understanding there are certain things they shouldn't do. So I had a conversation with the parent and lo and behold, she created a professional YouTube ADHD uh, documentary, which went live and it's on my LinkedIn if you want to have a look at it. Uh, and this helped the teachers to understand that there are needs of the kids, not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. So this has helped and also it's helped the child to gain the self-confidence uh, the child needs to go into the classroom and say, look, I've got ADHD, I've got difficulties sustaining my concentration in class, and these are the things I need. And you've got to be aware of it because we've now, you know, discussed this together. I um, I think everyone is kind of touching on it um, and it's been in my head now, it just popped up in my head. Um, the, the shared practices are so important. Um, I mean, I think... Um, key strategies and tools, shared practices would be, I think my go-to as a Senko as well. Um, uh, professional learning community, shared practices, just like Sophie said, um, if you have teachers that are excellent, I had an Arabic teacher in my previous school who was absolutely amazing at teaching phonics to children um, who had difficulty with uh, short-term memory and who had intellectual impairment. Um, and I had her train on um, sounds and motion. So we fused the strategy that I learned um, when I was doing speech and language therapy and fused her strategy as an Arabic teacher. And she went in and she taught other Arabic teachers how to teach these kids that couldn't remember sounds very well. Um, and it's not just because they were English speaking, it was Arabic students who struggled with remembering sounds, remembering because Arabic has three different letters at three different points. So they had to kind of, <laughs> Uh, remember and memorize these and instead of making it um, an old school behaviorist kind of method they they were practically involved in the in the in their learning um, and the other teachers were all making notes and taking you know strategies and said oh this sign might not work for my child um, if it's too physical because I've got a child that's in a wheelchair let's change it up so having that professional again learning community and the the shared practices is is really amazing and and adding on to what Amita said um, about uh, using the community, using parents definitely is amazing because no one knows your child better than you do. I mean, uh, you, you can say your teacher or the teacher that's been with your child, the SEN teacher does, yes, definitely. But we don't always know what's going on. I recently had um, an au pair ask me, um, because we had to go down an ASDAN checklist of, does the child tell jokes, for example, is one of the communication strategy checkpoints. Um, and I said, no, she doesn't tell jokes at all in class. And they, mom was very shocked and the au pair saying, she tells so many lame jokes at home. How does she not share these jokes at school? <laughs> and I said, well, we have to create an opportunity for her to, to share her lame jokes. I'm ready for them. <laughs> Let me experience them, please. Um, so parents going in and teaching the teachers about how to work with their, with their children is great. Um, and then I also um, just wrote down that I had uh, students before in my previous school where they would do really well in the math class and they would do poorly in, let's say, English or science or wherever. And I would go in and I would say, can you tell me what do you do differently Tell me, how do you do? Um, can you share that with the science teacher or with the English teacher? 
Um, and it was either something that some of the teachers like um, Devika and Sophie said earlier about they were very hesitant to try these new strategies because I feel like it's a teacher's thing, you know. We don't want change, but we're all for change, but we don't want to change. <laughs> so just getting that, you know, talking to, to your colleagues, saying, what do you do? What do, what, can, what do I do? What do I need to change? And again, Sophie said that before. It's so valuable when someone comes to you and says to you, maybe think about it in a different way or um, having that professional relationship with someone where you're not offended if someone says listen that lesson could have gone way better or that strategy could have gone way better because I don't think there's a quick fix or one size fits all to all our special needs kids we could have um, you know the same profile of ASD or ADHD or dyscalculia dyslexia but in every class it would present differently because it's that relationship with that teacher that's also influenced by that strategy. And that just sort of brings it the question. Sorry, yeah, Devika. Sorry, I think I just uh, wanted to add to what Angelique said. Uh, she touched on a very important topic that is collaboration with the parents. Mm. And I personally feel that uh, one of my strengths would definitely be collaborating with the parents for the child. Uh, so recently, I had one of my students who was uh, struggling with the submission of assignments. And um, he used to forget an assignment that he used to, he had to work on. Uh, so what me and the parents decided is to have a common uh, Google document where we made like a simple table where in school, the child worked with me, added the assignments that were due. And when he needed, I added the assignments that were due for him, like a due date. And uh, the mother knew that, you know, when the child comes back home, we need to sit down and see what is due for us. So uh, they had a very good idea of, for a simple reason of uh, like a very non-verbal collaboration between me and the parent that these are the things that we have to finish. And once they are done, we highlight it so that the educator knows and the teacher knows that, you know, this has been submitted. So, uh, and I would say this particular strategy worked beautifully for that child from he uh, being able to get the support of the teacher to write down details about his assignment to now writing details of the assignment on his own and highlighting when he submitted it. So it started off with the parent and a teacher collaboration and leading to a skill that the child has developed. So I think it's uh, it's uh, one of the things that I really feel happy about for the child. Yeah. That's great, Devika. And I, I think it, it sort of adds to that common theme, doesn't it, throughout this conversation that we've had. And, and again, uh, indeed, for, for all the sort of uh, the actual uh, the topics we're, we're looking to build conversation around in ISN, actually, um, there's a similar conversation about the fact that collaboration is so key and opening lines of communication between parents, between students, between teachers, and then between the teachers within the school that have these different skills to to collaborate and bring bring those different um, best practices from different subjects into the into the same environment. Um, so how you know just just sort of before we move on to my last question, how have each of you created those um, those sort of lines of communication and how would yeah I mean looking at I suppose my question is how would you advise a school that maybe is a bit more siloed that maybe struggles to to build that collaboration internally? Where would you advise they start? You know, um, is is there any any thoughts that you can sort of add there as to how to I would say start with concept. questions. We had, uh, I, I'm very fortunate now to um, to do my master's at Middlesex University, and we actually recently spoke about it. So I feel very <laughs> proud that I listened and I was awake that <laughs> during that lecture. <laughs> but um, our lecturer just said, um, ask why. Um, it should be a three-tiered why question. Um, if you have an issue in your school or something needs to change, why does it need to change? Does it, want, does it need to change because you see the issue? Or does it need to change because the teachers will benefit from that? that from that change um, and asking that three-tiered why question um, and delving deeper into the structure of what what do you need to do what is your action research going to be what what did um, um, we have to kind of complete CEF forms or so self-evaluation forms for our inspections as well what did your CEF form say and what can you build on for your community in that um, I, I would say that would be my my go-to is always ask a why question um, but from a perspective of is this change necessary or um, on, on what level is it necessary? Let me rather put it that way. <laughs> Can I add that uh, one of the things that has been very helpful in my practice is uh, to ensure that each of us as SENCOs or 
practitioners of SEN have an open line of communication. There has to be an open door policy. I have, uh, for the sake of my own time and energy, spent numerous days and uh, hours hammering this fact that if you are in any doubt, please, our doors are open for communication. Because the way we have to provide for the needs of our kids is tremendous. We're looking at every aspect of their need. And uh, there are many ways teachers can help, not just cognitively, as I've mentioned before. So the lines of communication within a school can be opened not by the Senko being very free to this opening, but also impressing on the senior management team that there should be a time set. For example, recently I have gone into department meetings. I've set departmental meeting times. It might not always happen, but I try to go into department meetings at least once a term with all the list of names of the kids and their needs. So this opens a whole forum of, look, this Senko or this practitioner is really wanting to collaborate, is really wanting to understand. And this leads me to, if I may, uh, a, a quote that I remember very well, uh, hopefully, uh, is a child will always say, I am not who you think I am. I am not who I think I am. I am who I am, so help me, please. And the person to help is the Senko. <laughs> That is amazing, Amita. I would just add that, um, yes, asking questions and having that open door policy is amazing. And we should all strive to do that, to have our door open and to be welcoming of all the questions. However, I do think it's important to also think about dedicated time for that. Uh, teachers usually have full time tables, they have marking, they have other responsibilities, they run extracurricular activities schools tend to push um, ourselves, of course, but also teachers very much. <laughs> and we want to have quite a high quality teaching all the time. Sometimes we forget that they also have personal lives. We all have personal lives. Um, so I think it's really important to timetable some of that specific time for them to master something, for them to work on something, for them to come to our open doors and ask those questions. I think it's very, very important. And another thing I would say is that Yes, we ask them teachers what they need. Yes, we ask them about what they want to learn, but schools need to be prepared to answer those questions. Yeah. Um, what if they say, yes, I want to learn more about ASD because, because great. How are we going to teach them about that? Are we going to you know, give them a budget for CPD? Are we going to bring someone in? Are we going to do learning communities? As we, as we said before, we have to give them options because if we continue asking the questions and we just give them a leaflet, it's, it's not going anywhere. So I definitely yeah. think if we are going to move forward to asking them what they need, we have to be prepared to you know, follow on their answers and make sure that we have the resources, whether that's personal resources or a budget um, to help them and support them through that learning that they're asking for. I think just, uh, just to add, I feel that, you know, uh, like everybody has mentioned that a dedicated department meeting time is extremely important uh, to have a viewpoint of the multiple educators who are working across PYP, MYP, and DP, and just to get an idea of um, what they feel is going well and what they feel needs to be changed or worked on in a school environment. And uh, for us as a team, uh, we meet once a team, uh, once a week, and uh, we discuss like uh, what is working well and where we need to work on at length. And I think uh, a Senko uh, role is to collate all of that information. Once you have that information, you also need to trust your teachers to be able to, and you know, give them a free way to be able to make those changes within the system around them as and when they think is going to benefit the child, the teacher, and the institution. So I think there needs to be a very important uh, mutual trust uh, that the leadership should have for the teachers to give them that free pass to do what is essential for the students. And also for the coordinator to have like a bird view of what is happening in the organization, taking a feedback from everybody and then having direct access to the management, to the leadership, 
to be able to strongly recommend the changes. And in that case, I would say the management needs to be open enough, uh, inclusive in their understanding to be able to make those changes and provide for what the school is asking for when they ask us what we want, mm -hmm. like Sophie has mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Um, we actually had that comment um, on our recent inspection that we had that um, they want to see a uh, active Senko role in, in the senior leadership team, whereas there's not many schools who do that currently. Um, I think for fear that we might talk too much <laughs> as Senkos or we might cost them too much money <laughs> if we do speak our mind. But that was one of the comments that they had recently. And I think that's what the UAE is looking at now is getting that head of inclusion or director of inclusion or SENCO in SMT so that they can also give their valuable feedback on, on that 40% grade that the school needs in order to get that outstanding or that, you know, that A, you're an A model school. Um, so yeah, definitely agree with you, Devika. Can I just quickly add that uh, this is uh, from experience. Uh, since I started at Dwight School, I have been given the role, uh, not only as a SENCO, but as head of personalized learning, um, as being one of the senior uh, leaders in the school. And the value that this has brought, I was a middle leader in my other school, but being a senior leader within the school setup has opened so many doors in terms of the senior leadership understanding and I think with the new code of practice in UK, the new law, they have now advocated because of many Senkos not having the time to express their views and their needs uh, to allow this to happen more formally. But Dwight mm -hmm. School London, I'm glad to say, had been foresighted enough mm -hmm. and uh, put me on as a senior leader. And it has been invaluable because the first port of call for any good practice is their senior leaders to understand the needs of the special needs kids. And without that, without the senior leadership support, and I would say their muscle power, you cannot organize meetings, mm -hmm. from what I said earlier, you cannot organize um, events like providing a uh, SEN child to be confident means providing opportunities outside that of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So you have enrichment activities, and that you can actually muscle into the schedule by saying, yeah. okay, my child is going to produce something in the assembly because they did something very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that opportunity was lacking as well. So mm -hmm. the profile of the SEN, not only the uh, policies and the practices, but the profile of the SEN child begins to improve as well. And that, that sort of leads me really nicely on to my last question, um, sort of the future of um, special educational needs provisions in, in uh, schools or international schools. Um, how, how can we ensure that that sort of whole school approach that, that we've been talking about um, and uh, when developing SEM provisions going forwards? Um, you mentioned having a SENCO as part of as part of the senior leadership team, a, a voice um, representing, um, you know, that, that seems to be a really key theme here. So. Any other thoughts on, on sort of the future of, of, of SEM provisions in, in schools, or international schools, um, and how it can be adapted and developed? I feel like um, this is something where it's a bit of a controversial <laughs> topic and a controversial topic in my uh, a question, in my opinion, um, because I am still of the belief that we should not have all students with special needs in mainstream schools, just because of the fact that um, some of them might not flourish and some of them um, don't need to be in a mainstream school and have that pressure of I need to complete science, math and all, all that jazz. Yes, um, I'm in a school where I'm fortunate to present the ASDAN program and the alternative pathway program, um, but not all schools have those um, support um, structures or resources to be able to present alternative, proper alternative pathway programs. This is not just an adaptive curriculum or a change in, you know, differentiated worksheet. This is like a proper structure of, this is a completely different model or a different program. Um, other schools, firstly, might not be able to afford it. And secondly, they they might not, they might say, yes, come, 
Um, and I've worked in schools like that where they say, yes, please come to our school. But at the end of the day, like Sophia said, there's a child that sits at the back of the class working on worksheets while all the other kids are, you know, taking part in practical learning experiences. Um, and it is difficult. I mean, if you think about some of the kids that really that pop into my head is um, schools that I've worked in before. We had a grade nine student who read at a grade one level. Um, how on earth as a science teacher or as a biology teacher or a math teacher, are you going to be able to differentiate for that child um, that can only read at a grade one level? Um, the child feels rejected. The other students feel annoyed by that child. You feel frustrated as a teacher. This goes beyond just normal differentiation if you think about it. So welcoming these kids, um, like Sophie said earlier, if you ask these questions or they, the teachers ask you these questions, what am I supposed to do with this child? What are you doing to help that teacher? You can't just say differentiate for them um, because at the end of the day, differentiation is is a tool yes it's a tool in our pocket that we can use but it's not always as effective as you know the the niche word or the niche market wants to believe it is and I feel like um, if you have a child that is excellent at let's say dance and drama why is that child in a mainstream school where they're being forced to do math why are they not being redirected to a vocational program that can give them what they need um, or that can make them happy? Because at the end of the day, even if you have a neurotypical child or, or atypical or neurotypical child, your goal as a parent or as a teacher, do you want them to be happy or do you want them to be an A model student or you know get 100% at the end of their grade 12 or their DP program? Um, to me, it's, it's on it. Honestly, from my heart, I don't want to see kids with special needs suffer, and I don't want to put unrealistic expectations on parents. If their child is not able to do something, I feel like it's my duty to tell them, your child has 100 other talents. Why are we focusing on forcing them to learn Pythagoras theorem when I don't even <laughs> know what it means myself? We need to focus on what kids can do and what parents need to understand is if we work with them collaboratively, their kids are going to flourish and their kids are going to achieve. Mm. But again, if we look at the future of SEN, I don't think that we should disregard um, special needs schools. And I think there's a lot of people and a lot of um, high up politicians and management that want to get a, do away with special needs schools. There is a place and a time for special needs schools, and there are so many kids who can still benefit from those schools. Yes, mainstream adaptive curriculum, as done, and all the other ones that there are out there that, that I don't know yet <laughs> um, are important, but we should not do away with main, um, special needs schools, in my opinion. Can I add to that to say that in UK, uh, basically the uh, move towards mainstream schools has rather been due to funding. And a lot of um, uh, special needs schools around us have closed tremendously, you know? Uh, and a lot of these, uh, the parents have put the kids in uh, mainstream school and particularly in private school because they are small in number. There is a, a, a more alternative curriculum. Um, at our school, we provide um, ed Excel type functional skills we've done as Dan, I think the, one of the most important aspects is what you mentioned. There has to be an alternative curriculum so that a special needs child who's functioning three, four years below their chronological age in a year group where they're supposed to be functioning at a certain age level of their own peer level, uh, can't access the broad and balanced curr curriculum, then we have to ensure, I think one of the things that the CENCOs need to um, press on both statutorily as well, as well as with the senior management is the more alternative curriculum that the child gets, there's more likelihood that the child with, will um, transition to the uh, uh, educational pathways in a more you know, comfortable, happy, secure manner that they've achieved something because our kids who start at year seven and finish in year 10, if they can't finish their MYP and don't get better grades, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. This is a very difficult conversation. So what I have done is in order for um, parents and teachers not to feel um, as if they've not provided is 
by the time they say a year seven child is in year eight and is um, not getting the grades they require, each individual subject department starts a policy with me that if they're not getting beyond a level three or beyond a level four, which is the median range, average range, we start thinking of alternative curriculum well in mm -hmm. advance because mm -hmm. you've already been perhaps, I don't know how you all do it, but we test them with their cognitive abilities test. And mm -hmm. we already know that there's a certain innate ability and a taught ability that these children have in terms of their strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses. So you start to negotiate when they don't produce the grade level that they should do in within two years, or what they, which subjects they have to drop and what their pathway should be. And this should all perhaps be negotiated with um, uh, alternative providers. And one of the uh, useful aspects I found is apprenticeships, because a lot of our SEN children are very gifted, uh, not academically, but more on the soft skills. So they say, you know, so they say, so I, I would say that having alternatives, particularly um, uh, vocational type alternatives, or apprenticeships is the way forward mm. to ensuring that our SEN kids are actually in the educational spectrum in a more secure way and have a provision to transit to <laughs> higher level education and remain in it because the dropout level in UK of SEN kids not going to university or colleges is tremendous mm. and we know mm -hmm. why they've got this yeah. Honeymoon period up to year 10 or 11 or MYP, um, M5. Mm -hmm. They can't go to diploma. Then what do you do? You're stuck. Mm -hmm. And you haven't made that provision for the child. So schools have got to start thinking about this best practice mm -hmm. alternatives with apprenticeships and vocational mm -hmm. qualifications a lot in advance for this to succeed. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, Amita Angelic. and Angelique, you asked the question, and uh, my answer would be, of course, I want them to be happy. I want all of my students to be happy. I want them to feel that they have a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. I don't want them to be disappointed and frustrated all the time and to then decide just to drop uh, off school because they, they can't stand it. No, I want them to be happy. <laughs> um, so I think the future of STEM provision, I want to go back to admissions because I think it starts there. I think we have to be very honest about the kind of provision that we as a school can offer to the families. Um, and for schools to be able to say, sorry, unfortunately, we don't have the resources at the moment to cater to your child's needs or to say, actually, we do. And we are willing to work with you if you're willing to work with us. And this is how we envision your child's educational journey. Um, and another thing that I can think of that I think it's essential is we have to have those difficult conversations on time. Um, yes, they're difficult. It's very hard to tell a parent that their child is not performing because of A, B or C circumstances, but we have to have them. If we wait until they get to year 10 Amita, for example, the parents are gonna be extra resistant. Their child, the child is going to be very frustrated and when we haven't done what we are supposed to do. So um, just, bracing ourselves for those difficult conversations and having them on time, I think it's essential. Um, and going back to what you said, Amita, I think it's essential to have as a school um, information on alternatives for parents. I, as a professional, I have this um, as a personal policy that I don't ever want a parent to leave a meeting with me without giving them opportunities, chances, choices, different things that they can do with strategies. They, they should never leave a meeting with us, with a counselor or an educator in general, without Without us giving them um, additional information of what they can do. It's not easy to, uh, as a parent, to hear um, that the child might need additional support, but we can do, if we can give them um, choices or opportunities, they're going to feel at least a little bit better. So that's how I see the future, having those difficult conversations on time, starting in admissions and being honest about the provision we can give to the child and um, uh, informing them of the, the potential options that we that we know of. Fantastic. I think we're very much on the same page. I mean, I have nothing to add. It's uh, uh, our ideologies, our ideas are very similar to what SEN is going to be in future and how we need to prepare us 
prepare the parents and also have an idea of the alternative strategies that can be uh, provided to the parents and not only have an idea but also build those alternative strategies um, sometime in our life for special needs students uh, to accommodate them in a different part of the world I would say. Hmm. Wonderful and it seems like the um, I, th I think another question that would be great to touch on maybe in a part two session would be how to have difficult conversations and it seems to be a common theme that that is you know obviously they are difficult to have right so there, there must be key strategies and initiatives that people have tried that have worked and and you know how do you lead especially parents um down the path to have those conversations and, and be more open um and be more honest uh, with parents because um, sometimes it is it is difficult right depending on on the context of the school the region etc so um yeah i think that could be a definitely a, a very interesting part two discussion um but yeah any other final thoughts before we wrap up um it's been a, a great session um any other, well, any other for, the, for the first time i uh, i didn't jump when he kept saying sen 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 because that's my surname and it oh. always <laughs> <laughs> you were born for it i mean so. <laughs> I just I'd just like to say that uh, what you said, Devika, that you you didn't have anything to add because we've touched on absolutely everything. It's amazing to see that across regions, across countries, across practices, across um, the needs are there, uh, the needs for improvement are there, also the the success stories are there as well. So I think it's important to recognize that. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and it's fantastic to have all these different ideas and thoughts, uh, you know, insights from different regions, but it does seem that there are commonalities, right? And I think the more we continue yeah. to build this conversation, the more we bring in other individuals that specialize in, you know, in Zen and Senko, and maybe, you know, even senior leaders to be a part of this discussion. Um, again, what we touched on earlier, the fact that it's so important to, to have open communication, open dialogue between all members of the school and um, with regards to this topic is, is essential so yeah thank you so much again for your time you know kicking off this conversation you know we have many more of these uh, discussions i'm sure but this is a fantastic um you know start to this um and yeah thank you so much once again all for your time and um yeah look forward to hopefully a part two soon <laughs>